Well, here's another, and this is one that we talked about from the very beginning of something to wrestle the red rooster portrayed by Terry Taylor. <laughs> I guess the gimmick is he's a cocksure rooster man with a dyed red Mohawk and he's going to strut his stuff and take on the company's finest. Of course, in real life, Terry Taylor had a good little run for himself in uh, mid South and the UWF. And then when he finally moves up to the big league, so to speak here in the world wrestling federation, he debuts as a baby face but then turns heel on his partner, Sam Houston, and is rebranded the Red Rooster with Bobby the Brain Heenan by his side. And uh, mostly the Rooster is working uh, house shows with the occasional match on Challenge or Superstars. He'll beat the likes of Ken Patera or Junkyard Dog by Countout. And eventually he starts to uh, see that Heenan is arguing that he could turn this inferior Rooster into a superstar, demeaning the Rooster, stealing the Rooster's money, generally embarrassing the rooster on national TV. And after rooster loses a match to Tito Santana on Saturday night's main event, Heenan slaps the rooster. That leads to a feud with Heenan's new client, the Brooklyn brawler which culminates when Heenan and the brawler attack the rooster on primetime wrestling. And he cut the top of his hair short, dyed it red, spiked it to look like a rooster's hair. And he starts cutting promos that ends with cock a doodle doo. Yep. His last major feud is against uh, Dino Bravo. He's going to lose almost every match on the house show loop. And to think this guy almost was Mr. Perfect. I think the debut happens. No. Go ahead. Uh, no, I almost Mr. Perfect. Who, who says that? Who said that? Him, him, him. One. So one person says, oh, I could have been Mr. Perfect. No, no. Mr. Perfect wasn't this gimmick that we had. Mr. Perfect was a gimmick that was perfect for Kurt Hennig. And that was something that Pat Patterson had come up with and, and Vince in talking to Kurt because of all the things that Kurt did. Kurt was an outdoorsman. He was a sportsman. He played every sport. He did everything. That perfect gimmick was perfect for Kurt. It was never discussed or even remotely thought of for Terry Taylor. So, you know, if that's something that, that Terry has said, oh, I could have been Mr. Perfect. No, you couldn't have. Because that wasn't that wasn't thought of for you. That was that was one where it was the the talent in Kurt Hennig that made that gimmick. It made him perfect in everything that he did. And frankly, I don't think Terry could have pulled that off. So that myth. It's just that a myth that was never the case ever. So when you say, well, he, he could have been, no, he couldn't have been. It was, it was not discussed. It wasn't in the cards. It wasn't, oh, well, we're going to do this or this. I can go, I can go back to Steve Austin and the ringmaster and Sandman were two gimmicks that we loved. We loved the name of the Sandman, a really smooth wrestler that could, you know, had the sleeper as a finish and, different things, but they had to be a real smooth worker. And we discussed Dustin Rhodes for that. We discussed uh, Steve Austin for that. And then, you know, the ringmaster, the master of the ring that could, you know, just out-wrestle everybody and be this incredible technician, which eventually went to Stone Cold Steve Austin. We never did do a Sandman. But that was something where we were we had gimmicks in the back of our mind that we would always think of, hey, who could, who could do this? Not so with the perfect gimmick, not so in any way, shape or form. That was Kurt Hennig and only Kurt Hennig. Um, the red rooster was again, something that didn't necessarily mirror society, but it married, it mirrored the characteristics and the attitude, um, the personality of Terry Taylor. Terry was very cocky. Terry was, was, was cocksure. He was a very cocky, arrogant guy. Um, very good in the ring, very good in the ring. But I think that Terry's biggest, biggest fallback was Terry just wanted to be Ric Flair. Terry wanted to dress like Rick. He wanted to work like Rick. He wanted to, you know, have his gear look like Rick. He wanted to do promos like Rick. There's only one Ric Flair. Go be something new. Go be yourself. Go be something other than a knockoff of something else. 
which is why, you know, when Buddy Landell did the Nature Boy gimmick, he's just a cheap imitation of the real Nature Boy, Ric Flair. So with Terry's personality, it was, again, the word cocky kept coming up. And, you know, it was when you look out of the barnyard, who rules, who, who rules the roost? The rooster. The big fucking cocky red rooster, the, 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 the one that impregnates all the hens, the cock of the walk. I mean, and it, it's, a, it's a rooster. It's a banny rooster. They walk around with their chest all puffed out and constantly, you know, that was the main, the main damn chicken, if you will. And again, is it something that, you know, people, when you look at it uh, just on the surface, oh, the red rooster, that's a stupid, silly gimmick. Well, if, if you don't want to get into it and delve any deeper than that, okay, that, that's your opinion. But when you're looking for something to take a, an ordinary wrestler whose gimmick, for lack of a better term, was to be another Ric Flair, but there already was a Ric Flair, and they didn't do it as good as Ric Flair, and no matter how good they did, it would have always been compared to Ric Flair. Or you create something new for them. And you get people talking. And I dare say that people still today are talking about the Red Rooster gimmick over any other gimmick Terry Taylor ever did. What was he in in uh, in WCW, the $100 guy or something, where he tried to rip off Ted DiBiase's gimmick? Taylor made man. Okay. And, and then uh, he was, was he, was he the, the one with the with the computer? Or he was yeah, in Alex in New York, Marlena before she was Marlena. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, ripping off something else that had already been done by another guy and done much better. So it was the poor man's version of it. So to that, the Red Rooster was an attempt to make him stand out of the pack, to make people remember. Oh, I remember the guy with his hair all spiked up in red and, you know, walking around the ring, strutting around the ring. Guy, guy thinks he's a damn rooster. Right. He's so proud of himself and so cocky and he's so arrogant. He talks about how he's the best and by God is a rooster. You know, I run, I run this here hen house in the WWE. Again, using metaphors and nobody expected him to, to be a, an actual chicken. They expected him to take on the characteristics of what a red rooster would be and give him some personality and infuse that in him. And I dare say that had Terry embraced it, said it a million times, said it to Terry, had Terry embraced that, that I think Terry would have been one of the biggest stars. And still to this day, he is known for that time as the Red Rooster. Good, bad, or indifferent. That's what he's remembered for. Not the time of the $100 guy or whatever the hell he was and. And WCW. I think it's worth mentioning too, that there have been some pretty successful gimmicks in wrestling that maybe on paper do sound a little silly. The undertaker's supposed to be dead. Doink the clown. I mean, there's lots of things where people can say, oh, well, that'll never work. But if the performer embraces it, they do. But I do want to ask about the creative, like, all right, set aside the way you feel about the the gimmick, the persona, the name, the strut, the hair, whatever sort of being, I don't know, emasculated by Bobby Heenan. And then we're in a feud with the Brooklyn brawler and losing the Dino all the time. It, this just thing, it, it feels snake bit. Was that his creative because he wasn't embracing it? Oh, so being a part of Bobby Heenan's family and being managed by Bobby is emasculating. No, no, no. I'm How just is saying, that emasculating? Well, he's having a feud with a manager, and it's to introduce a new character in the Brooklyn Brawler who's essentially an enhancement talent. To get the rooster over, he's working a program with arguably probably the top heel in the entire company in Bobby Heenan. Yes, I agree. And that's, and that's emasculating? Well, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't get that at all because, again, it was a way to make him, and it was to show the example of um, I'm Bobby Heenan. I can make anybody. I'll take Steve Lombardi, who's a loser, and I'll make him a winner. But yet he couldn't, and the rooster prevailed at every step. But in doing so, I don't think that – you know, Terry embraced it enough to go, you know, beyond that because he didn't believe it. He didn't want to be the Red Rooster. 
here's what I'm asking, I guess. First of all, I appreciate you're fired up. I hope everybody's watching on video, something to wrestle.com. Bruce fired up is fun, but let's pretend let's just change the names here. Instead of rooster losing a match to Tito Santana on Saturday night's main event and getting slapped around by Bobby Heenan and then starting a feud with Brooklyn brawler. Now it's Mr. Perfect losing a match to Tito Santana and getting slapped around by Bobby Heenan and starting a feud with the Brooklyn brawler. I just don't see that you would have booked the Mr. Perfect character that way. Well, no, because they're two different characters with two different human beings behind the character. No, you wouldn't have booked Mr. Perfect like that, but Terry wasn't going anywhere as Terry Taylor. He wasn't going anywhere as Terry Taylor. Wasn't working. It was just another guy. We had to create something for him. With Kurt Hennig as Mr. Perfect, I dare say, you know, Kurt Hennig, you're, you're talking about two completely different human beings and two completely different performers that put in their gimmicks. It's You're talking apples and pomegranates at that point. He debuts July 12th, 1988, meeting Tito Santana in Madison, Wisconsin. It's a house show. He is going to be on pay-per-view for the 88 Survivor Series and the 1990 Royal Rumble. And he's going to leave after he's defeated by Akeem, the African dream in New Brunswick, Canada. You think Terry was relieved or disappointed when this run was over? I would say I would bet Terry would have been relieved. I think that Terry, you know, look, Terry didn't like the gimmick. I, I don't think that's any secret. Terry didn't like the gimmick. Terry didn't embrace it. Didn't want to do it. And I think Terry wanted to be Terry Taylor. So, um, but again, that was disproven when he went and became somebody else um, elsewhere. But it, it, it's like, yeah, I think he was relieved. I think he was happy to be moving on because um, he, he didn't like being a gimmick do you uh I'm, i mean i'm picking up just listening to your tone as you discuss this it feels like you have a hard on for terry taylor no That's not it. at all not at all man Let's terry get- and, and terry and i you know and years later I, I through the years terry and i didn't always see eye to eye didn't always get along but again through the years you also mature and you realize that, you know, first of all, there's two sides to every story and you take people for what they are. And Terry and I, yeah, if you were to ask, you're asking me my feelings right now. Um, and I'm totally good with Terry Taylor. And I think that we've got a pretty good relationship right now. 